Welcome to the 41st episode of The World of Running. I am your host, Aditi Pandya. We are in an age of instant gratification and if the response time is less than a fraction of a second, our anxiety, fear and self-doubt creeps in. Now, before we go any further in today's episode, I have a request for all our listeners. If you like our podcast, do subscribe to it and do share it with one of your fellow runners who are yet to discover us. For more running tips, subscribe to our YouTube channel or our newsletter, the details of which are in the show notes. Imagine a scenario when you are scrolling through one of your social media sites and see a runner running effortlessly. You start comparing yourself and questioning if shedding a few pounds is a secret to unlock your next PR. The pressure to look a certain way, especially in today's age, can be intense and even for a recreational runner. We know that elite runners often focus on maintaining a specific weight, sometimes even with controversial results. We all remember the story of Mary Kane and the pressures she faced during the Nike Oregon project. But what about recreational runners like us? Is weight loss always a key to better performance or can it be detrimental? Today's episode explores reaching optimal running performance and weight loss. And our guest is Ivan Lynch. Ivan is the owner of Southeast Nutrition Clinic. He's a sports nutritionist based out of Ireland. He works with Dublin City University athletes and the Irish wheelchair basketball team. Ivan has also worked with Olympic sprint finalist, European cross country medalist, and Kona Ironman world medalist, among many other athletes. Later this year, Ivan is starting his PhD. Thank you, Ivan, for coming to today's episode. Thanks for having me, Aditi. I'm delighted to be here. So, Ivan, I was going through your podcast, actually, and uh, that's when I thought that it'll be interesting to talk to you. And you talk about a lot of um, ideal racing weight in one of your podcasts. So uh, many runners get caught in this ideal weight and what is that ideal race weight, right? So there are even, and I personally have gone through these formulas that um, if I'm of a particular height and if I have a particular BMI, but uh, this will be my race weight. So what are your thoughts on these formulas, especially for recreational runners? Yeah, it's a good question. So if you take an average athlete, okay, versus gen pop, someone who doesn't exercise, the average person doesn't exercise, an athlete of any description will have much more muscle mass versus a a normal person, quote unquote. The, The kicker there, muscle is much heavier than fat. So in active individuals, even recreationally active individuals, BMI generally misclassifies body composition for example for people watching on the video here technically i am morbidly obese my bmi is 34 i know you can only see me from the shoulders up but i'm not i'm not morbidly obese and i guess that's an important point because if we have runners using bmi as a metric for body composition that's erroneous to begin with and it's going to push them to be far leaner and lighter than is possible or possibly even healthy and I would add to that there are no equations to my knowledge that we can use that tell us as practitioners this is this individual's perfect weight for sports performance it doesn't exist got it so so Ivan uh, when you say that this weight does not exist and it can be detrimental now endurance running is demanding right and and logically speaking if i'm lighter i can go faster and i can have lesser injuries on my body considering that um i have i have to carry a lesser weight as compared to somebody else so how can uh, is weight loss always beneficial to recreational runners or this constant desire to lose weight can become detrimental with respect to other things like um, image or or mentally uh, or, or take a toll on our mental well-being yeah for sure it's a it's a much bigger question than people think it is so let me 
let me break it down into a couple of different segments for you. For sure, as you become lighter, your relative VO2 max and your running economy does get better. How much better? Probably not as much as people think, because most people ever only need to lose or have two to four kilos to lose. That's the extent of what we're talking about here. I would argue that you can be a brilliant runner at any weight, most weights, I should say. If you're very, very clinically obese, of course, losing weight will help you out. If you're already relatively lean, relatively healthy, it's trying to optimize something that's mostly already optimized. For most people, it's much more effective for performance to focus on strength, recovery, and making sure you're training in the appropriate zones to get the appropriate um, cardiovascular and cellular responses. I would say that's much more impactful than focusing on weight loss. And I'll, I'll kind of give you an analogy. You can only ever lose a certain amount of weight, right? But in theory, in theory, you can always get stronger you can always work on mitochondrial density. You can always work on plyometrics. And the, the capacity to improve those items far supersedes one's ability to lose weight. And as, as such, for the vast majority of people, it makes more sense to focus on those things and focus on recovery and fueling. And ironically, that generally leads to people having very healthy body compositions they might not be as light as they think they need to, but they might be very lean at a slightly higher weight that's more helpful for them. So that's that's part of my answer to the question. The other part of my answer here, and I'm sorry, but I, I never do short answers. I, I can't. Um, the other part of this question is, why do people want to lose weight to, to be better runners? And you, you mentioned body image there. Being lean is a cultural association of being an endurance athlete. So clinically, we classify running especially as a lean sport where being lean is championed, promoted, and I guess desired. It's correlated with better performance. As a result of that, it's pretty normal for someone to think, well, if I want to be a good athlete, I need to look like a good athlete. And what happens is troves of teenagers, weekend warriors or recreational athletes compare themselves to Mo Farah, for example. And it, it's just an unfair comparison because the level of training, the lifestyle, it's so different. It's, it's apples and oranges. So it's it's a tough one. But weight loss for me is never the key for sports performance and over focusing generally leads to detriment more so than success so in theory i do agree to what you're saying even and i am guilty of thinking especially when i have to run a competitive marathon and if it is a goal race of mine and i do think that if i come on i'm i'm already closer to my um like the question will be in my mind that i'm closer to my ideal race weight because i've googled it multiple times and why don't i just end up and uh, end up doing some you know especially the best way to do is like a calorie deficit diet right so how can runners determine if their current weight is negatively impacting their performance that's a good question i'm not sure if you can to be honest i i, I don't know how you would measure it i think it would always be subjective and I, again don't get me wrong here. I do help people lose weight and body fat. If someone very clearly has body fat to lose, we focus on that. Definitely would focus on it in off season. So if someone does have some excess body fat and they're feeling a little bit sluggish and they're not, they're not fit, they're finding it hard going when it's hot or there's a hot climate there. If they're in a racing season or they're already training hard, it, uh, losing weight that close to races is not advisable. 
So if it's something that I felt there was room for improvement with, it's something that you would work with in your off season. And I mean, in theory, losing weight will improve running economy and VO2 max, which are performance determinants. They're not the only ones, but is there a way that we can directly measure weight loss's impact on performance? There actually isn't. That would be, for now, that would be subjective to a very high degree. Um, I know this is a running podcast, but the analogy I would use or kind of the, the example I would refer people to is um, Christoph Blumenfeld. Do you know who he is? You'll have to give some reference to our, our, our listeners here. Okay. He's the Olympic triathlon champion. Blumenfeld, he's a Norwegian guy, I believe. If you look at him, he does not look like what you would expect an Olympic triathlon champion to look like. Maybe if I said he was a professional darts player, you would think, yes, that's what this man looks like. And I'm pointing this out not to, I guess, cast uh, comment or judgment on what someone looks like. He's a brilliant example that aesthetics, having some body fat and performance are not generally as inextricably linked as people think they are. Google him, Christopher Blumenfeld, Norwegian Olympic triathlon champion. He is the creme de la creme of triathlon and and, an endurance sport similar to running. So to answer your question, I don't think there's a way to measure it. In some cases, people do have body weight to lose. It's not something that I would focus on if they're already training hard or almost at their intended race. It's something you focus on in an, in an off season. So I had my goal race was in February this year and it's already done. And this is considered to be my off season. And uh, I did hear one of, uh, one of my colleagues, uh, running friends actually telling me that, you know, don't focus on weight loss during your season. It is better to focus it when it is an off season because you are relatively, your mind is free right and and especially a number on the scale is not generally directly proportionate to your running ability but there are a lot of multiple other factors too and it can be factors like body composition muscle mass as you spoke earlier Uh, but can you throw some light on um, on what can be the other factors that help in improving uh, running apart from just the the scale the number on the scale Yeah, so I'll probably stick to food for this one because that's my domain of expertise. If we take, let's say we look at marathon running, is that is that the race that you had in February, Aditi? Yes. How did it go? Oh, it was it was brilliant. It was my personal best. Okay, nice, nice. Let's pretend you were one of my patients or my clients, right? And you said, "I want to be the best marathon runner I possibly can be." How can you help me? Here's what I would say to you. Okay, Aditi, if you're doing a marathon, and I'll just use marathons as an analogy here, we know that if you imagine this as a graph of, say, performance and carbohydrate intake, there is a linear improvement in performance with carb intake up to 70 grams an hour during exercise. So my my first focus point for someone doing an event that exceeds two hours in duration where someone is going to hit the wall or run out of glycogen would be fueling intra intra workout or focus on fueling for what you're going to do on race day and if you're not able to get to 60 75 grams an hour of carbohydrates which is generally a gel every 30 minutes and a sports drink every 20 minutes that's the first thing i would focus on because that's the easiest way to make sure there's linear improvement in performance for just taking carbohydrates. So there's that. If the athlete or person in question does lots of fasted workouts or their carbohydrate in general isn't really high in and around their training sessions, that would be the next thing I would look at. Do you know what the performance difference is, Aditi, in terms of an outcome when we have an athlete that's, say, carb fueled and adequately so versus reasonably fasted or on a low carb diet generally speaking what's the performance difference do you think 
during the race i think with the carb uh, carb loaded uh, runner they'll be able to perform better because uh, because it is an endurance sport and it will help them um not hit the wall yeah it's it's 10 to 15% of a difference in performance in terms of finish times in endurance sports for carb fueled versus not so the the most common two issues i would see with athletes is they don't eat enough carbohydrates they have an obsession with fat optimization and they they're not very good at fueling during training or and then indeed races so i would start there and if you can get those two things right that puts you in a position to do what you are actually physically capable and trained to do so now that that this is something that you spoke about that carb loading is way more important especially during the racing time i want to just add to this right and I, like it is an extension of the uh, of our previous question is that uh, a lot of people who are currently listening uh, to us are trying to constantly lose weight and they have conflicting body image issues or or they will or if they haven't ran for say past 52 weeks or 3 weeks or a month because they most of them are recreational they are juggling multiple things like their job the family and running and if they are not able to perform at similar levels that they were able to do a quarter back they might just feel that they've put on weight and thus they are not able to perform right so for this i have a question as to what are some of the safe and effective strategies who think that they have to lose weight and and their negative performance is because of weight gain right and and just being hard on themselves yeah so for cases like that and just for clarity right if i took a sample of runners I would expect the rate of eating disorders to be three to fourfold higher than, say, any other population in the world for a start. So if someone, if their identity is, I am a runner, I used to be like this. I, I was a professional race walker in a past life. I'll use me in as, as an example, actually, it'll be easier, right? Because I used to think, as you have described, if your athletic prowess or the fact that you do sport is a big part of your identity which is fine that's okay unless what it means to you to be a runner is being really lean having no body fat maybe dressing a certain way maybe being seen to eat a certain way talking about certain things if if your idea of what it means to be a runner means that you look a certain way, you're going to have body image issues. And if you're someone that over evaluates appearance and the importance of appearance and having low body fat, as soon as something goes wrong for you, racing, training, whatever, that's going to be the first thing that you jump to because it's the only thing you perceive as a threat. So I see this all the time. I have, um, say, recreational athletes there, maybe their parents, maybe they, they work, maybe they have other stuff going on. They have a bad race. And they don't acknowledge the fact that their baby keeps them up at night or they're having a stressful time at work or there's there's external factors. They had a bad race, obviously, because they were two kilos overweight. And if you're listening and that's something that resonates with you, I would Think about your body image. Check in on that. Do you put too much emphasis on weight and what you look like? And if so, here's my question to you. How do we determine how good someone is at the sport of running? Is it A, how quick you can run, or B, uh, what you look like and what you weigh? And it's really important to bear in mind what sport you play because there's lots of runners and cyclists and endurance athletes who think they're in the sport of bodybuilding or think that they're in a weight category sport, which they are not. So to come back to your question, I realize I, I kind of did slash didn't answer your question there. If you are looking to lose some weight, you can do that for sure. Safe ways to do that would be portion control, watching for snacking, watching for comfort eating at nighttime. Those would be the, the three key things. 
cutting down on things like alcohol or takeaways or eating out, that would be some other steps most people can take. If you're someone who's losing weight to be a better runner, or you think you have to lose weight to be a good runner in the first place, maybe weight loss isn't a healthy thing for you to approach. And maybe it's time to consider, well, why do I really want to lose the weight here? Is it is it to look better? Is it to be more acceptable to others? Or is my self-esteem and identity wrapped up in a sport and I think I need to look a certain way to to meet that um, puzzle piece that I've made for myself? So really think about that. If you fall into that latter camp, weight loss is not a healthy thing to pursue. So are there any any specific food or eating habits that runners should follow if they want to, um, say, prioritize on improving their their running? Or is there any any consumption strategy? Considering that being a nutritionist, you would be there would be certain habits, right? Like have vegetables and protein before you have fat or carbs, or is there a way we can strategize as to, okay, you can maybe do this first and then go to, say, eating sweets or anything else? Yeah, there, there's a lot of things we can do. Broadly speaking, if um, if I had a thousand patients and I, I blindfolded myself and closed my eyes and I wrote down on a piece of paper what they need to do, normally... I can summarize consultations into four words. More carbohydrates, more often. And for an endurance athlete, that four-word sentence generally captures what they really need to do. Most athletes overconsume protein far beyond where it's beneficial, not necessarily to the point where it's dangerous, but beyond what they need to. And athletes tend to over-evaluate the requirement for protein and end up missing out on dietary carbohydrates as a result. So if I'm trying to structure an athlete's day, what I would like to see is throughout the course of the day, good caloric distribution. So not skipping meals, not having long times between meals and having something at the start and end of the day. That's important, especially if they train twice a day. It ensures that there's good glycogen availability. For those listening, think of glycogen as a fuel tank for athletes. And that fuel tank is filled with dietary carbohydrates. Things like um, rotis, chapatis, rice, naan bread, um, couscous, for example, as well, would be another option. Or fruit juices. Those types of things fill that fuel tank for athletes. So... As a, as a broad, broad kind of generalization, three main meals with a portion of carbs, a palm sized piece of protein and about a fist of vegetables or fruit, depending if it's breakfast or not. That's a good start. Having something carb rich before bed and then for snacks between meals, focusing on the, I guess, the health check boxes like nuts and seeds and things like that to get your healthy fats and fiber in. If we were to look at where the athlete trains, you mentioned sweets a minute ago. I would want an athlete to consume sugary carbs, sweets, some might say, around exercise, because they'll be assimilated and used almost instantaneously, and it's appropriate to do it at that point. So for for people watching, if you imagine your day is like that, that's morning, that's night, if you train in the afternoon, I would hope that you have a high carb concentration around training specifically and the rest of your day might look like more kind of standard healthy eating guidelines. So it's still more carbs more often, specifically around training, focus on healthy eating for the other parts of the day. That's the general pattern that that I would advise. And I think it's important that an athlete is reassured and listeners that you're reassured that you can have some sweets or chocolate or ice cream or whatever the thing you like is there's no rule or evidence to suggest that that's bad for negative for sports performance that's a cultural belief not a scientific fact so don't don't uh don't get that twisted 
got it so now i so you actually uh, answered my question of nutritional mistakes that people make uh, while they are training but i want to talk about cravings right and uh, like we are all humans and we all train our minds and we are wired in a way that if i achieve a particular thing i will treat myself with a particular um my favorite my favorite dessert or my favorite food something like that so how can runners manage these urges and are there any healthier choices around it so i guess eating behavior is interesting because mostly not all eating behavior is driven by hunger at least in the, the patients i work with if we have an athlete that's getting cravings i would assess well are they actually legitimately just very hungry and is that a reflection that they're not eating enough overall or they're not fueling exercise well and as a result might be struggling to maintain their blood sugar is that what the cravings are if so i would just recommend they increase their carb portions and focus on getting enough carbohydrates in during exercise the second aspect to that is the cravings that we're talking about is that emotive eating or comfort eating does it happen when the person is stressed or bored or anxious or what any negative emotion there's a good kind of rule you can use to establish whether you're comfort eating or if you're hungry true hunger rises slowly over a couple of hours you, that that signal builds and you get increasingly more hungry comfort eating or emotive eating it's like that it's on instantly and it has an agenda i would like chocolate now for example that's comfort eating if someone is finding themselves in those scenarios it can be helpful to put healthier options in their immediate environment say mostly this happens to people when they're in their home at nighttime because they're bored putting things like popcorn or protein bars or yogurts those types of foods are pretty brilliant to have on hand if you do get cravings because they're they're quite healthy they're not really high in calories they're not going to have any negative impact on the person the other aspect to that though is if the person feels out of control with their eating behavior or it causes them i guess some stress or emotional strain i'd probably be screening that person for binge eating disorder or similar and it's not necessarily a case of just offering them healthier options there may be a psychological issue going on there at that point i'd probably refer them to a counselor a therapist or a psychologist in my in my practice we work with a counselor so if we screen and see this person is engaging in elements of disordered eating we talk about it and we refer them and they get a multidisciplinary approach to manage it so the the cravings and someone's appetite can really tell us an awful lot about their mental state their mental health and how good they are at engaging in sports nutrition it's just important to discuss and figure what are these cravings telling us so there is a interesting um, fact that i i i came across that body image issues starts to people as young as 5 year old kids nowadays right and they they yeah. do not want to eat and and it has started at a very very young age and we are very hard at ourselves now also a lot of us have we we have different kind of uh, you know nutrition intake right and these are different kind of fads that we follow maybe we are we become we are vegan or we do intermittent fasting or we are we just try to eat food which is gluten free and and many of these diets emphasize on certain food groups so are these approaches beneficial for runners to lose weight and what's the optimal way to manage nutrition uh, in terms of performance and weight so there is no optimal diet to lose weight in fact when you compare say ketogenic diets with high protein with high carb with vegan paleo whatever when you control for calorie intake they all have an identical impact on weight what it turns out really is moving things for people here let's say i have a relatively standard irish diet i eat a lot of potatoes 
if someone said to me, listen, cut out the potatoes, I would probably lose weight because that makes up a large portion of my diet and I mightn't replace it accordingly. It's generally a red flag if to lose weight, someone is advising you cut out a food or a food group. That's generally not necessary and it misses the point. Um, weight loss is all about calorie balance. Whether within your caloric remit you ha- you eat millet or chocolate or sports drinks is actually largely irrelevant. And it's, it's those types of dietary interventions or guidelines that people give that perpetuates the idea that there's good food and bad food. And I guess the general push for weight loss itself it's not a surprise that kids have body image issues. They learn it from their parents, to be honest, and they learn it from society. Um, so I'll, I'll answer the, the first question there is there's no best diet to lose weight. It's all about calorie balance. You can generally achieve calorie reduction with just focusing on healthy eating. That's what I tend to do with people. And on the body image side of things, I'll give you a personal example. When I was 15, a teen, a child, technically I was preparing for the world athletics championships and I was in very good shape I was physically fit someone said to me an adult said "Mm, if you lost a little bit more weight you'd probably perform better and I thought because I was 15 huh maybe I'm overweight I should lose weight it didn't go well that was that caused me a lot of problems or Another example, somebody saw me again. I might have been younger. could have been 14, 13 at the time. I, I was a high-level athlete from a young age. Someone saw me eating chocolate and said, hey, you can't do that because you're an athlete. I didn't have the clinical faculties I do now. So uh, as a child, I said, oh, athletes can't do things like that because that makes them lesser as an athlete those two transactions had a huge impact on my body image my mental health and I actually developed reds or relative energy deficiency in my late teenage years and I attribute it to those two transactions and if I thought about a lot of the patients I work with so I work in both sports nutrition and clinical dietetics if let's say you go to a house and you talk to the mother in the house, she might say something like, I've been very bad this week. I've had some alcohol. I've eaten some chocolate. I had a piece of cake. That's a very common thing for me to hear. That phrase alone, the phrasing of that, that has so much stuff behind it. It infers that there's good food and bad food, that it's always important to be vigilant for weight gain. A weight loss is generally better. And that these sets of behaviors are okay and these sets are not. It will be impossible for a child not to pick up on that. So I'm not at all surprised. And the statistics show us that rates of eating disorders and disordered eating in kids is skyrocketing. It's because of our aesthetic culture and the expectations, partly on athletes in particular, to look a certain way. But then the wider population as well, misinformation, misguidedness, comparisons, that all doesn't help. So, Ivan, time of fueling, right, also plays an important role and the time when we eat our meals. So, does timing and order order play a significant role in weight loss and nutrition absorption? Weight loss, no. Uh, Absorption, yes. If I eat a highly complicated meal, like high fiber, high fat, very soon before I exercise, I will malabsorb most of that and most of it will end up in the toilet or I will vomit. That's the only kind of way the timing is relevant. For weight loss, though, timing otherwise doesn't matter. It's it's not a relevant factor. And how does runners and how can runners adjust what they eat in the hours before and after a tough workout or a long runs to boost their energy and ensure their uh, recovery? Mm-hmm. So for two hours before and about two hours after exercise, I would stick to whiter carbohydrates. So white rice, white bread, 
nothing high in fiber stick to carbohydrates beige is generally a good rule of thumb that'd be the easiest way to to approach that so for the two hours before and after exercise it's not about healthy eating guidelines it's about getting high 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 intake of carbohydrates in easier to digest quicker to absorb so it's um that's what spore concentration looks like so that that's that's probably all all there would be to it all right so now that you've mentioned that you know being lighter might not always be advantageous right but what are some of the strategies runners can use to improve performance if they are not able to lose weight focus on doing strength work specifically plyometrics that's a big one make sure you're training in the correct zones use a heart rate monitor do a vo2 max test check that that's really important get your bloods done if your vitamin d is low or your iron deficient or there's some some issues with cortisol levels that would be worth addressing generally eat more carbohydrates for sure do that start fueling during exercise maybe look at taking a creatine supplement um that's where i would start it's probably hard to be more specific without an individual in front of me to you know assess but those would be a good set of first steps most people would see massive improvement if they did that and i want to now focus on supplements so what are your views on supplements and how can they benefit runners whether it is achieving their goals or recovery or performance so i think they're ancillary to a healthy diet good lifestyle sleep quality and just being consistent with training if all those boxes are ticked a multivitamin is generally helpful vitamin d and omega-3s are generally helpful after that you can look at taking things like creatine beta alanine hydroxymethyl butyrate or possibly sodium bicarb or beetroot juice those all have impacts on say explosive power speed strength endurance lactate buffering or vo2 max caffeine is another helpful one as well that people probably already consume um so they, they would come in as additional factors but if you imagine it like the pyramid that stuff is the tip of the pyramid and pointless in pursuing unless you've got all the other boxes ticked and most most people don't do all of the fundamentals well so i'd supplements wouldn't be the first second or third thing we would talk about it's kind of the last point but that list i mentioned there caffeine creatine beta alanine hmv beta juice those are your short list of evidence-based supplements for athletes anything outside of that probably doesn't work or is very very case specific and what can be the potential risk that people should take into consideration while consuming this probably not much of a risk not not really i mean use informed sport to make sure that what you're taking is batch tested so that there's no contaminants in it that would be the only risk or precaution i would suggest with creatine if you have kidney issues that's something that you can't have or if you have a family history of renal disease creatine is not okay but as long as that's not the case you should be fine there's no other kind of risks or factors to consider understood so ivan i also wanted to speak to you about um body fat and performance right while researching for this podcast i realized that women athletes generally have body weight percentage between 14 and 20 uh, whereas men have anywhere between 6 to 13% and having said this recreational runners will end up having higher fat percentage so what is your advice to recreational runners who will feel pressurized to reduce their fat percentage and uh bring to an ideal level so i guess that's a tricky one to answer there's there's very few direct answers to these questions unfortunately aditi um it depends how we measure body fat first of all So there's large margins vary with how that's done. If it's a skin fold test, if it's a BIA scale, or if it's a DEXA scan, you can take one person and measure their body fat in three different ways and get three wildly different results. So that that's one thing I'd like to point out. Generally speaking, professional male athletes will be 
12% body fat. Professional female athletes will be in the high teens. Normal people will just be a couple of percentage points above that. So it would make sense. It makes sense that people want low body fat because their heroes have mostly low body fat levels. Subjectively speaking, when we look at them. But, you know, 10% body fat can look wildly different in 10 different people. And I'll never forget, I worked with this professional triathlete before. He was 9% body fat, but didn't look like it. If I told you he was um, someone who'd never exercised in their life, you would probably believe me. But multiple national champ, like really top guy. And aesthetically, you don't you don't necessarily see the low body fat. It depends on the underlying muscle structure. So for someone who feels pressure to lose that body fat, I'd probably ask yourself, why do you feel under pressure to do that? Is it self-imposed? Is there a cultural expectation? Do you have a medical condition that requires you to lose weight? If so, fair enough. Just make sure that you're losing weight for the right reasons and that your motivation for taking care of yourself, for running, for diet, managing healthy eating, your lifestyle, make sure that's not done just so you can lose weight and be leaner. That's a really dangerous thing to do because you're going to put your self-esteem in an external factor as opposed to being driven by internal factors. So the, the quality or the type of motivation is really important here. So I guess if you are a recreational athlete and you're feeling under pressure to lose weight, stop and think about why you're doing that. Is it so other people will like you more, think you're a better runner? If it's something like that, I would probably not focus on the body fat itself. Focus on taking care of yourself, cultivating a healthy self-esteem and making sure you do things correctly for your sports performance and you'd probably end up anyway being a better runner and slightly leaner. Um, it's different for everybody, though. It's kind of a hard question to answer, I suppose. Got it. So as you mentioned that the reason of why losing fat is more important and that was that is more rhetorical than being asked publicly. So there are a lot of ways, as you mentioned earlier, to focus on strength and recovery and eating right so that would be better than just losing the fat percentage. So even I also heard in one of your podcasts how athletes are generally undernourished, leading to issues like reds and low bone density. So what should recreational runners understand about these risks, especially if they are focused on weight loss? Yeah, it's a good question. So for those that don't know, reds or relative energy deficiency in sport. Think of it like malnutrition for active people. There's an imbalance between input and output. You're not eating your requirements. When you don't meet your requirements, energetically speaking, you catabolize elements of your body to do that. But if we take that too far, so if we just maybe put ourselves in a mild deficit of 300 calories, that's not really going to have any physiological impact on us. Maybe we're a little bit tired. That would be it. If we put people into sharp energy deficits very quickly, that can suppress immunity. It can cause bone demineralization. It, the, the processes of bone demineralization can kick off very much instantaneously. It can suppress the hypothalamic pituitary axis that governs fertility in men and women. So menstrual cessation or erectile dysfunction can actually be very common outcomes of that very quickly as well. More so when women, men take a little bit longer for the effects to become apparent. If we look at patterns of under eating, so if we take someone who eats enough but has very long gaps between their meals or does intermittent fasting but trains in the morning, even simply doing that despite meeting your needs on paper the pattern of eating can massively impact endocrine health from anything like IGF-1 to cortisol levels at baseline to bone mineral density again. 
the risk of reds is not exclusive to elite athletes it's considered to be I, i've seen papers rated anywhere from 20 to 90 percent depending on the cohort you look at from all kind of levels and echelons of sport it's very very common if you're doing a very long distance event where it's just physically hard to meet the energy demands or if you're in college people just going to university or making a big life change make moving to a new place those are higher risk people for that as well that that can sometimes be the case so what what to know about it if you're trying to avoid such an outcome and i would advise you to do so try to eat regularly include all the carbs carbs at every meal and avoid doing fasted training or skipping meals that's probably the simplest answer to that question but it it always surprises me not so much anymore the actual impact it can have like one of my patients at ET is a she she won a global marathon big marathon I can't say who or which marathon for confidentiality she's in her 20s she has spinal osteoporosis she's in her 20s and there's fertility issues there as well there's no coming back from that that's it forever like in my role there is minimizing the damage and just i guess graduate from what she was doing to eating healthily and hopefully we get her cycle back but if you have osteoporosis in your spine that young i can't imagine what you're going to be like when you're 60 70 and the medical burden and morbidity that comes with that and that, that's just a recent example so it, it can have a really devastating impact on people yeah i i had osteoporosis in my sheen bone and it was it was scraped off 80 percent. i was pretty young and it, it grew back so the age was the factor there and it it helped me to grow back but it does have its own side effects so i do empathize with this athlete Ivan, I want to uh, talk about mental well-being and 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 weight. And I did talk to one of my one of my fellow runners that uh, we are having a podcast today, and this is the topic. So even they were so happy to and are waiting for our podcast actually to be released. Is the constant pressure to maintain a certain image can be exhausting for even recreational runners? And what advice would you give to our listeners? on balancing their self-care and performance goals? I'm trying to think of a good answer here for that. Spend less time on social media, okay. unless it's my Instagram. Look at mine, obviously. I post the content. Shameless plug. Um, or I'll rephrase that. Be very selective what type of social media you cultivate, what type of algorithm you cultivate. Be very selective there probably don't spend time comparing yourself to other people try to catch yourself in image comparisons um de-emphasize weight if you have a weighing scales pick it up and throw it in the bin that would probably be step number three and and then it's just practicing meeting your needs you know um working with Working with the nutrition protocols, making sure you're fueling, making sure you're eating consistently, actually taking care of yourself, cultivating the narrative that I take care of myself, I meet my needs because I want to be the healthiest, best athlete I can be, builds a healthy self-esteem. And people, generally speaking, with higher self-esteem don't, generally speaking, have body image issues and generally don't fall into those patterns of let's say dietary restriction and then not so and then so again um if we deal with the the self-esteem or the mental health that's probably in the background anyway by focusing on those things you break that cycle that's that's the only way i've ever seen it work while doing the research for this podcast also came across the story of rachel uh, shulist maybe i'm pronouncing it wrong uh, and uh, she improved her performance by gaining weight and focusing on overall health, right? And this was also encouraged by her entire coaching team. So what are your thoughts on building a community to create a healthy relationship between weight and health and performance? Yeah, I think if you 
have the access and resources to do so, do it, you know, whether that be having colleagues or running partners or training partners that aren't, I guess, image obsessed. So be careful who you run with. That can be a big, a big factor. Be careful who your coach is. So I hear coaches tell athletes all the time to race, you need to be A, B or C weight. And there's no, the, the number is totally arbitrary. Like they just make it up. But the athlete holds that because coaches are put on the platform. Yeah. So be careful who your coach is. If they give weight targets or, you know, focus a lot on fat and image and all that, that's a big red flag. Otherwise, if, again, you have the resources to do so, working with a sports dietitian, working with an SNC coach, maybe a sports psychologist or counsellor, if relevant, that's obviously the best way to go about it. But like, say someone like me, like my services aren't free. Like people have to pay to work with me. That's not available to everybody, which is why I make the podcast and social media content. But if you're listening and it's something you struggle with, do try and get some support or some assistance, or at least change your training environment at the very least and who you train with, that might make a big, big impact. Sure. So, Ivan, we are coming to the last segment of today's episode. And uh, I these are like a quick fire questions for you. And I wanted to ask you that, are you a runner? And what is the longest distance you have run? So I'm not a runner. I actually hate running. I've tried it. I don't like it. I was a race walker. Do, do you know what that is, Aditi? No, I know th- wh- what is a race walker, but I didn't know that you were a race walker. I did that professionally. That's that was that that's why I'm interested in sports nutrition. So I was a professional race walker. I represented Ireland for about four or five years and I retired when I didn't qualify for the Rio Olympics. So that's that's what I did. My race distance was twenty kilometers. The longest I'm pretty sure I've ever traveled on foot was about thirty kilometers. So you've gone further than I have. All right. So Ivan uh, do you have any favorite healthy recipes and would you like to share any quick ones for runners? I'm a very simple man. Um, my favorite recipe is I, I have an air fryer and I get these gluten-free toasts with like bread. I put some olive oil on them, pinch of salt, put them in the air fryer, take them out. I have it with a coffee. That's my favorite breakfast. It's about 40 grams of carbs in it good bit of fiber that's that's what i do if i was giving a recipe to an athlete i'd probably modify it something like a bagel with nutella and some orange juice is like an ideal breakfast if you're exercising in the next two hours so that would have been my favorite when i was competing and training got it we have one last if our audience wants to reach you what's the best way yeah, so I'm very easy to find. If you Google, if you just Google Evan Lynch Nutrition or Evan Lynch Dietitian, my website will pop up, the Southeast Nutrition Clinic. You can also email me at evan at southeastnutritionclinic.com or get at me on Instagram. It's E Lynch Fitnut, F I T N U T. As I said, I'm very easy to find, pretty responsive to messages and if you're thinking you've got, I'd like to work with Evan and his team, but I don't live in Ireland. Don't worry. We actually work with clients and patients all over the world because most of, most of it's done remotely and it works pretty well. So you can, you can work with us if you wish, even if you're in India or whatever part of the world you're sitting in. So we'll be sharing your details in our show notes so that all our listeners can reach you directly. So thank Great. you for your time, Evan, and I wish you all the best for your doctorate later this year and good luck thank you very much have a nice day i would like to thank all our listeners and if you like this episode and would like to know more on the world of running please subscribe to our channel and if you know of someone who is starting their journey into fitness and running do share our podcast link with them i would like to thank my friend arvind for editing sound recording and taking care of the post-production for this podcast If you have any suggestions on improving the content of the show or topics you would like us to cover, 
please share it by emailing us at connect at geeksonfeet.com or you can also reach us through Twitter, Facebook or Instagram.